Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to the science data and analytics track of PyConline AU. Uh, for our next talk, we have Genevieve Buckley talking about Dask Image, distributed image processing for large data, which I'm pretty excited by. I've been hearing a lot about Dask, and I'm, I'm super keen to see what sort of things that we can do with it. Uh, quickly, a little bit about Genevieve. Uh, she's a scientist and programmer based in Melbourne, Australia. She builds software tools for scientific discovery. Her interests include deep learning, automated analysis, and contributing to open source projects. She has a wealth of professional experience with image processing and analogous analysis spanning X-ray imaging, fluorescence microscopy, and electron beam microscopy. And she is a maintainer for the Dask Image Project. So take it away, Genevieve. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people of the Kulin Nations, whose land that I'm uh, speaking to you from today, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. As Ned said, the project I'm going to talk to you today about is called Dask Image. It's a project for distributed processing of large array data. Uh, my name's Genevieve. I'm, uh, yeah, as Ned said, a programmer and a scientist based in Melbourne, Australia, and maintainer for this project. So who needs a project like Dask Image? Well, if you're somebody who is working with array data and you're using NumPy a lot um, and or like the SciPy n-dimensional image functions and you find that you're running out of RAM or hitting that kind of a ceiling, then Dask Image is a project that's built for you. There are two main cases with uh, distributed image processing. Uh, there's a case of batch processing where we have um, maybe uh, a lot of uh, different images where you want to apply the same kind of analysis or processing steps to them. This might be something like uh, video data where you have a lot of individual video frames or um, something similar like to that, where the processing that we do on the first image frame really is totally independent and has nothing to do with what we do to like the 10th image frame. The second and slightly more complicated um, option here as a use case is where we have data that has a really large field of view. And this is a little bit trickier to handle because while we might be able to do uh, things like chopping our data up into many small tiles and processing each of them separately, uh, it becomes a bit tricky uh, in the joins and the gaps. Uh, we want to be able to uh, have a bit of overlapping happening at those edges so that we don't get strange edge effects. So these are the two main use cases where it's really helpful. Um, we certainly might find uh, in the second case, the large field of view, that RAM is certainly an issue. In the first case, maybe you're sort of squeaking by because each of the single images uh, aren't particularly large, but if you're putting that in something like a for loop, it might start being a bit time consuming and just kind of dragging, dragging you down. For a couple of uh, different scientific motivating examples, I just want to show you here um, that the kinds of data, array data, we can use with Dask are really, really broad. We have from the very, very large um, on the left, I have uh, an example of some Sentinel satellite imagery uh, being shown in the Napari image viewer. And this covers like hundreds and thousands of kilometers on a very regular basis. Uh, right down to something at the very other end of the scale, uh, so the very, very small. Over here we have um, some fluorescent image data, uh, microscopy of individual neurons within brain tissue. So there's a really wide variety of kind of applications for these techniques. So if we want to get started, um, we have links to our documentation page uh, from the GitHub Dask Image project. And you can install Dask Image from Condaforge or from PIP, uh, whichever your preferred package manager is. We have five different sub packages within Dask Image. Uh, the first is imread uh, for reading in image data. This, pack, uh, this part of Dask Image is built on top of a Python library called PIMS. Uh, PIMS is excellent for lazy loading of images and it's really quite flexible and allows you to read in uh, lots and lots of different types of file formats um, all the way from like video files, um, all sorts of interesting things, right the way through to um, things that might be like more proprietary uh, microscopy and data file formats that you might typically only be able to open with something like bioformats. So there's a lot of choice there. 
Uh, the remaining four sub packages are really focused around processing that data or what we do with it after we've turned it into a dask array. So we have an ND filters package that contains things like Gaussian filters, median filters, uh, convolves, correlations, a Fourier transform package with a bunch of Fourier transforms, uh, a morphological, like ND morph is our morphological operations package, uh, and this has a lot of binary morphological operations that we might use to tidy up mask images, and an ND measure package which really has a lot of measurement functions um, that we can use. So we have um, on our documentation page this nice table that really kind of gives a clear overview of uh, the function coverage we have relative to SciPy's ND image um, functionality. What we're trying to do here is really provide a very familiar API for people. So in many cases, we're kind of mimicking, uh, in almost all cases really, we're mimicking the API of SciPy ND image um, and just allowing that kind of scaling to happen. I'm really excited to announce to you all today um, that in our latest release of Dask Image, we actually have included uh, support for arrays and computation on the GPU. Um, so this is really fantastic. We have that support um, available in two of the sub packages at the moment, um, the ND filters package uh, that I spoke about earlier and our imread package. We're able to do this by using a Python library called Kupai, which is has a NumPy-like API, uh, but works with CUDA in order to do computation of array data on, uh, on the GPU. So instead of having Dask arrays where each individual chunks are NumPy-based, um, we can have Dask arrays where those chunks are Kupai instead. Uh, we're going to roll out uh, increased support across the rest of the sub-packages in Dask Image, um, and we're quite a way towards uh, a little bit of that now, particularly uh, in the morphological operations sub-package, but there's still a bit of work that needs to be done both in Dask itself and in Kupai in order to sort of support uh, that rollout. So that's what we're working on now. Uh, but how much does that help really? Um, it, uh, we want a bit of a speed up by using the GPU, but how much is it worth it? Well, Matthew Rocklin uh, wrote a blog post a while back where he randomly generated two terabytes of data and ran some computation and compared it on a single CPU, multiple CPUs, uh, a GPU and multiple GPUs, and found that uh, the kind of computation that was taking over two and a half hours on a single CPU got a really significant speed up just by moving that onto one GPU and when expend, extended to eight GPUs, like a small cluster, this thing that was taking two and a half hours suddenly down to under 20 minutes. So there's some really exciting performance gains we can get by uh, adding this kind of GPU support, which is why I'm excited to announce like the very beginnings of that. So you've heard all about it. You're probably excited. Now you want to try it. So great, let's build a pipeline. Um, we'll do that now. Let's uh, take a bunch of images. We'll read in some data. We'll do some filtering, segment some objects from those images, do some morphological operations, and then we'll measure something about those objects. Um, I'm going to use the uh, publicly available image data set from the Broad Bio Image Benchmark Collection. And this data set um, is a lot of single like 2D image frames of fluorescence microscopy data where the nuclei have been stained. So those are the bright objects that we see here, the nuclei in individual cells. So to read in data, we're going to use our imread module. Um, and I can pass it uh, a file path to like a particular folder and this wildcard.tiff. So I have a folder, it's full of images. I want all of the TIFF images to be put in this Dask array. And by default, uh, now every image file that was an individual file on disk is now a separate chunk in the Dask array. If I wanted my array to be sitting uh, on the GPU with Kupai, I could specify this with this array type argument. So when we want to um, do segmentations, our really common pre-processing operation is to filter images and blur them very slightly before we do 
that um, segmentation. This just means that we usually end up with like nicer, smoother um, edges to our masks. And it's uh, just a really kind of useful first pre-processing step. I'll use a small Gaussian filter from the Undo Filters package, and um, we can do that here. Now, in order to segment um, objects from the background, we could do something um, that's just like an absolute threshold and just say that, say, everything below this threshold value, it's part of the background. Everything above it is something that we uh, think is part of the objects that we're interested in. It's maybe easier to talk about this if I show you this. So I'm going to open uh, the Napari image viewer and show you what that looks like with our data set. So here is the data set uh, that we're looking at um, with that fluorescent nuclei data. Um, a lot of different image frames looking very interesting. Um, and if I turn that off and just look at this threshold image that we've produced, um, we can see here it's looking pretty nice, but actually one single threshold is not fitting all of these images. Some of them look all right, some of them less all right, some of them really terrible. So you know what? I think we can improve this. So maybe something that's going to work a lot better than a single number that we expect to work for everything uh, could be using a local thresholding method. And so we have one of those available, which is great. Uh, and we might want to try it. So with local thresholding, uh, what you do is essentially you choose a method and you choose a region uh, or a spatial area that you want to kind of apply this to. Because each of um, the image frames are separate and there's quite a lot of variability in the intensity for each, uh, we're going to make our local threshold local purely to like each image frame. So we'll calculate thresholds separately for each of those images uh, and take a look. So we'll do that. Let's, let's load it and see. Um, I think that could be good. This is interesting. Um, yeah, and so I'll turn that off for a second and just make it invisible. So we'll compare it to what we had originally, which is our like absolute threshold, working well for some, not working well for others, um, and compare that to the thresholded image uh, using this local threshold method. And you know, that's looking a lot better, at least to my eyes. So I'd say we're happy with that. And what we want to do next is to tidy up um, some of this mask uh, that we've made using some morphological operations. Morphological operations are maybe a little bit weird to wrap your head around if you're not using them a lot. Um, so I'm going to just take a moment um, and a few diagrams from the OpenCV webpage in order to just talk through some of the concepts here. So we'll talk about uh, what erosion, dilation, and then opening are. And then we'll try that on some of our data. So an erosion is a type of morphological operation where we have a binary image. So pixels are either black or they're white, they're true or they're false. And what it does when we apply it is eat away at the edges of, of those objects in the image. Um, so we can see that it looks like everything's kind of shrinking around this letter J. A dilation is the opposite operation, essentially. So uh, instead of shrinking away at the edges of an object, we're expanding that object out. It's kind of blowing up a little bit like a balloon. Things start to get interesting when we combine these operations in different ways. And so what we call a morphological opening operation is a combination of these two things. Uh, so what that is is one erosion, and then we follow it by a dilation. And so what that means here, we can see on the left with this J, we have a lot of like bright pixels, single sort of spots hanging out in the background there. And if we do an erosion on this image, um, what happens is that if the uh, bright spot in this background, if it's smaller than the structuring element that we're using for that erosion, it'll disappear and become completely black. So by the time we get around to doing our dilation, uh, which effectively restores um, the main object in this image to kind of what it originally was, those tiny little background blobs aren't there anymore to be expanded. So we've, what we've really done is like cleaned up a lot of the noise uh, that we might have had around our signal. 
So I think we should uh, try one of these morphological operations. We'll do a binary opening on our mask image. And because all uh, dask image operations are n-dimensional by default, what that means is they're going to assume that whatever dask array you hand them is all like one thing. And that's great, but it's actually not strictly true in the case we have here. In the case I've shown you, uh, every, uh, every image frame is kind of separate, but we're storing them all in a single dask array. So what I've done uh, to get around that is just be kind of careful about the structuring element that I'm using in this case, where I have uh, what the default 2D structuring element is, and I've just bookended that by uh, like zeros on either side. So that means when we do this processing, um, each image frame is kind of counted individually. So fantastic, we have almost our pipeline complete. What we're gonna do now is measure something interesting about those objects that we've segmented now that we're happy with it. So just in the interest of keeping this demonstration nice and quick, um, I'm probably going to just measure a very small subset of the entire data set here. We have hundreds of images in this like fairly small example data set, but each of those images really does contain uh, like maybe around 100 nuclei each on average. Um, so now that we're moving from what was uh, operations happening on the whole images to operations that need to happen on each individual object, um, we're just going to like cut down uh, the size of our data that we're actually doing this on um, so that we can see this in a reasonable amount of time. So in order to measure these objects, we're first going to have to create a label image from the mask that we have. And what a label image is, is uh, if we take a mask and we look, it has a lot of bright pixels and then a black background and some other bright pixels. Each of those individual isolated blobs are labeled with a different integer value. So this means we can separate what, um, which pixels are part of which objects uh, in a really kind of easy and identifiable way. So we're going to do this just for the first couple of frames. We can see even there we have like almost 300 um, nuclei that are being picked out. And what we can do now that we have a label image is actually uh, make some measurements on each of, each of the things that we've labeled. I'll just show you first before we do that what those labels look like just so we have a bit of a sense of kind of what we are doing but maybe not maybe Napari has had a little hissy fit um, all right so, so this is our label image um, and kind of this is what we are um, going to going to use all righty so the very last part of our processing pipeline is to use those labels and use the original images and we want to measure stuff about each of the labeled sets of pixels that we have. Uh, like I said earlier, we have a lot of different uh, uh, measurement functions available in our ND measure package. Um, and we're just going to pick a, a handful of them. Today we will measure the area um, in pixels of each of each of these segmented objects and we'll also measure uh, like the average intensity for each of those as well. And that would be something that's like uh, fairly straightforward, fairly common uh, to do in an image processing pipeline. So I'm gonna go ahead and just like plot some of this data. Um, Remember that up until now, we haven't actually run our computation. What we've been doing is constructing the dask task graph, which is essentially a map for, okay, this is what computation I want you to run when, um, but hold off on actually doing that until I tell you to, um, which is a really fantastic way to be able to then um, kind of seamlessly kind of move between like a, an analysis you might do on your single laptop up to uh, being able to just scale that out over something like a supercomputing cluster or onto um, like a very sort of wide range of compute resources. But now when we actually want to see what the data is, um, this is and I want to plot some of this 
on a graph, it's going to do two things. It's going to run the actual computation and then plot the results. So I'm just going to make a graph here um, and we might just show you something that's um, say a graph of area in pixels along the x-axis compared with on the y-axis um, the average intensity uh, in each of these nuclei. So I can see here that maybe this is something that I would more or less expect. There's a lot of clustering uh, in this region here, um, so a lot of a lot of cells looking very similar, with similar brightnesses, similar sizes, um, a few different outliers um, in different different places uh, that may or may not be unexpected that we could sort of dive into, and it gives us a, a lot more kind of information. If we were running this on a really really big data set, uh, maybe we wouldn't want to plot every individual point, uh, but at this this stage, uh, now that our pipeline is finished, we might do things like uh, put that data into a data frame or run aggregate statistics or um, do something else for our analysis. So the full pipeline is maybe just a little bit too long to show on this single uh, image slide, but it is honestly quite succinct. Um, and the real benefit here is that um, unlike, say, an analysis that has a bunch of nested for loops, it really allows you to very easily inspect intermediate stages and just intermediate portions of your data without having to run the whole thing or run a lot and then stop at a particular point. Um, so this is, this is really huge. So that's great, but what happens if you want to do something that isn't included in Dask Image? Well, if you're using scikit-image, uh, which is very typical for a lot of image processing people, you can use their apply parallel function. Um, and what this does is essentially give you a nice way to put your data into um, a Dask array and use map overlap. You can use map overlap from Dask or map blocks directly yourself, uh, which is what we do in Dask image. Um, that's what our functions are based on. Or if you want like a lot of flexibility around what it is that you're doing and a lot of fine grain control, then you can use the Dask Delayed Decorator as well. When you want to scale up your computation um, from a laptop to say a supercomputing cloud, uh, the Dask Distributed Library um, is what lets you do that. And you can uh, import like a client, set up a cluster, uh, it's all very easy, it happens at the start of your file. So fantastic. Um, so if you want to get started with Dask Image or try some of this out, um, you can install it with Condor or Pip. We have our documentation available at Read the Docs, uh, and you can swing by our GitHub page uh, to check that out. Uh, I'm happy to answer some questions here, maybe, uh, maybe even in the text in the chat later on. Uh, I hope this was interesting and informative for you. Cool. Thanks so much for that, Genevieve. That was great. Um, yeah, we do have time for one or maybe two questions. Um, one from Jeff. In the CPU to GPU performance shootout, is the GPU using 16 or 32-bit floating point precision? If you happen um, to know. I don't happen to know off the top of my head. Um, I can shoot you a link to that blog post by Matt Rocklin, which may or may not have the details in it. Um, and if it doesn't, I think maybe Matt is the person to ask. Cool, cool. Um, and does a uh, question from Claire, does opening change the main object? Like for example, smoothing the edges? Yeah, so it definitely can, um, particularly, uh, so this J that we had drawn has a lot of like loops and things that are closed. So if your object is like very um, convex or like a sphere or something like that, you don't often see a lot of difference if you run an opening or you run a closing. Um, but if you have um, like bits where edges are maybe a bit like uh, like a very involved coastline or they're curling back on one another, um, then you can actually start to see differences happening there. Cool, cool. Um, there's one more question. I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna. It's, uh, so it is from Adam. We're operating on satellite imagery, and I have features that straddle chunks and are detected in one chunk and not the other leaving a half detected feature with a straight vertical line cutting it off. If these operations are performed on a per chunk basis, are there approaches that can be taken to prevent strange artifacts at the chunk boundaries? Um, 
yes, there are approaches. No, I don't think this is a solved problem uh, at all. It's certainly something very challenging. Um, I'd be interested in talking to you more about it. I think I'm more interested um, than like the one or two minutes we maybe have left here. Um, it's, yeah, like I said, it's, there are approaches you can take. It's not a self problem entirely, um, but it's fascinating. And I'd really like to talk to you more about it, particularly uh, so that we can maybe see if there's easy ways we can support this kind of use case better uh, in Dask Image. Yeah, cool. So it sounds like there's a discussion to, to, to continue on in Vanuous. Oh, for sure. Uh, just yeah. a reminder that we have both the, um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, yes, the stage conversation, and then we also have our, our science data uh, separate thread. So if it sort of goes beyond the length of, of, of the, the event proceedings, um, you can jump over there as well. Uh, so thanks again so much for that, Genevieve. That was great. Um, and uh, stick around uh, in the next uh, in ten, we'll be short break, and then back in 10 minutes, uh, and we'll be talking, uh, have a, a talk from Patrick Robotham on uh, model selection with Python an introduction to hyperparameter tuning. So looking forward to that and see you all in a bit.